All right, chemistry, uh, this is your video lecture for uh, chapter four, part two of the video lecture for chapter four. Um, we are going to move into the quantum model of the atom. But before we do that, let me remind you, in order to fully wrap your head around the quantum model of the atom, you need to have a solid foundation in the Bohr model of the atom. Remember, the Bohr model of the atom exists as a nucleus surrounded by concentric circles, with, which Niels Bohr referred to as orbits. Right? He likened it to planets orbiting the sun. Right? Nice, neat concentric circles. And he stated, right, in order to explain uh, the line emission spectrum of hydrogen, the, the reason that only four types of photons were emitted is because electrons could only exist at four different distances from the nucleus. We need to hold on to that and let it be our foundation for why quantum mechanics are the way they are. So in this section, moving on to the quantum model of the atom, I want you to be able to discuss Louis de Broglie's role in the development of the quantum model of the atom. I want you to be able to compare and contrast the Bohr model with the quantum model. Explain how the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the Schrodinger wave equation led to the idea of atomic orbitals. Notice that's no longer the word orbits. That's not the Bohr idea of orbits. This is the quantum orbital. List the four quantum numbers and describe their significance. And when I say significance here, I don't mean to say that they are important. I want you to describe what they signify. And lastly, and you're going to be studying this off of some charts and trying to figure out patterns, relate the number of sublevels corresponding to each of the atom's main energy levels, the number of orbitals per sublevel, and then the number of orbitals per main energy level. So before we get started, quick uh, reminder of what happened last section. In the first section of this chapter, we attempted to take something that has always been understood as pure energy with wave-like characteristics, light, as a particle, we attempted to look at it and uh, how we've historically understood light to have wavelength, to have frequency, right, and to travel at the speed of light. Hence the equation that we've used in class, C is equal to lambda nu. We also use the equation E is equal to uh, uh, Planck's constant multiplied by nu, right? E equals H nu. Energy equals a constant multiplied by velocity. In this section, we are going to do something very similar, but in the opposite direction. We're going to take something that has always been thought of as a particle, the electron, right? Always thought of as a particle. The mass has been known and calculated for over 100 years. It has particle-like characteristics. And we're going to begin to understand that it is a wave at the same time, at the same time. So that's why we have this title here, Electrons as Waves. Now, the French scientist Louis de Broglie suggest, or suggested that electrons be considered waves, but not just any old waves, confined to the space around an atomic nucleus. I want to repeat that again because that's the important part of the sentence. Confined to the space around an atomic nucleus. From this idea, being a wave confined to the space around uh, an atomic nu nucleus, it followed that the electron waves, again, we're thinking of electrons as waves, it followed that the electron waves could only exist at specific frequencies, meaning there are only certain frequencies that could exist. So if we remember the equation, the relationship, energy is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by frequency, okay, E is equal to H nu. If electron waves can only exist at specific frequencies, Okay, so this value right here, frequency, can only have certain values, right? For hydrogen, we see that there are four lines on the line emission spectrum. So there are going to be four frequencies in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Only four, meaning that there are only four energies, four energies that are associated with hydrogen, and that's it. And so when you look at the line emission spectrum for hydrogen, you only see those four bands, right? That characteristic four bands. So according to this relationship that we've already used in class, these frequencies correspond to specific energies, right? Because this constant H doesn't change. So when nu changes, E changes. These are the quantized energies of Bohr's orbits. 
So electrons, like waves, right? Because we're thinking of electrons like waves. The electrons can be bent. The academic language for that is diffracted, right? Diffraction. Diffraction refers to the bending of a wave as it passes, to, uh, passes by the edge of an object or through a small opening. Also, electrons, again, like waves, electrons can interfere with each other. Inter to interfere with one another is something that waves do as they come into contact with one another. Interference is a wave characteristic. Interference occurs when waves overlap. In 1924, Louis de Broglie proposed that electrons, like light, had properties of both particles and waves. De Broglie suggested that electrons be considered waves confined to the space around an atomic nucleus. De Broglie suggested that an electron would have a characteristic wavelength equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. It followed that the electron waves could exist only at specific frequencies equal to energy divided by Planck's constant. These frequencies corresponded to specific energies, the quantized energies of Bohr's orbits. Three years after de Broglie's proposal, C.J. Davison and L. Germer discovered that electrons can be diffracted by a single crystal of nickel. This important discovery provided the first experimental confirmation of de Broglie's theory. So now that we've established that uh, we can and should treat electrons as waves, or at least th they behave like waves, we're going to move on to the Heisen Heisenberg uncertainty principle and then the Schrodinger wave equation. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, the German physicist Werner Heisenberg proposed that any attempt to locate a specific electron with a photon knocks it off its course. Now, when we say to locate a specific electron with a photon, that means we're trying to ob observe it with optics. We're trying to see it, right? Because we see things when there's light. Remember, photons, right? A whole bunch of photons uh, makes up a light beam. So if we're looking at something optically, photons are bouncing off that thing and then coming into our eyes. So if we try to use that same strategy with lo uh, to locate a specific electron, the electron is so small, its mass is so small, that even a photon, even a photon can knock the electron off its course, meaning you no longer know, the fact that you observed it means that you no longer know exactly where it is. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to determine simultaneously both the position and velocity of an electron or any other particle. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't know the position of an electron, and it doesn't mean that you can't know the velocity of an electron. What it means is you cannot know both at the same time, meaning the more exactly I know an electron's position, the less I can know its exact velocity. And uh, uh, the other way around. The more exactly I know its velocity, the less I can know its position. Today, I'm doing an experiment that demonstrates Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So here I have a green laser, and I'm firing it down towards the front of the room through a narrow slit. Now that slit can be adjusted, so it could be made narrower or wider. And the laser spot is projected onto a screen behind it. So what do you think is going to happen to this spot on the screen as I narrow the slit? Well, let's have a look. You see exactly what you'd expect. The spot gets narrower and narrower. The sides are getting cut off by the slit. It makes complete sense. And if you stop there, you would never realize that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is at work. But if you keep going, something strange happens. As you make the slit even narrower, the spot starts to spread out. Isn't that incredible? You're making the slit narrower, and yet the spot on the wall is getting wider. The narrower you make it, the wider that spot on the wall becomes. To understand this, we have to look at Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is normally written as delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h on 4 pi. So what does this mean? Well, it's about the position and the momentum of a particle. So x is the position of the particle, and p is its momentum. So delta x is the uncertainty in position, and delta p is the uncertainty in the momentum. 
Now, if you multiply those two quantities together, they must always be greater than or equal to h on 4 pi. Now, h is Planck's constant, and that deserves a video all to itself, like this one by 60 symbols. But for our purposes, it's just a very small number. So in our everyday lives, we don't come up against this uncertainty relation because everything is much, much bigger than h. But as we narrowed the slit, we were decreasing delta x for those photons. So we were getting more and more precise about where the photons were passing through that slit. And at a certain point, you come to this limit so that if you narrow this any further, you're going to break this uncertainty relationship. So what needs to happen is the uncertainty and momentum needs to go up. I should specify this is uncertainty and momentum in the x direction, in the horizontal direction. So if before photons were going perfectly straight, now they must veer off to the left or to the right to ensure that we don't break Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And the more you decrease your uncertainty in position, the more narrow you make that slit, the more the uncertainty in momentum has to go up. And so if these photons are going to the left and the right, that's going to produce a much wider beam. It's really, really non-intuitive, but it's the way the world works. So on to the Schrodinger wave equation. In 1926, the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger develop, developed an equation that treated electrons in atoms as waves. And so certain characteristics were, uh, of electrons were thought to be wave-like. But Schrodinger was the first one who actually created an equation, a mathematical equation, to determine the frequency of electrons. Uh, and you don't actually have to do anything with the actual equation because it's a little bit over our head. You just have to know, remember, how the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the Schrodinger wave equation set the foundation for quantum theory. Okay, You don't actually have to do anything with the math on either one of those. You just need to know that together with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the Schrodinger wave equation laid the foundation for modern quantum theory. So what is quantum theory? Quantum theory, as complicated as it sounds, it simply describes mathematically the wave properties of electrons and other very small particles. And so when we say very small, we're not talking about even the actual atom. The atom itself is not on this quantum level, meaning this small. Electrons. Electrons are that small. Okay? about um, one eighteen hundredth the mass of a proton. Remember how small they are. They are so small that they do not behave according to traditional Newtonian physics. Hence, quantum theory steps in to try to describe how they behave. So, we need to know that electrons do not travel around the nucleus in neat orbits, as Bohr had postulated, just like planets, because planets are macro-scale objects, right? And they behave according to our traditional understanding of how the world works. Instead, they operate on the quantum level and they exist in certain regions called orbitals. An orbital is a three-dimensional region around the nucleus, right? Three-dimensional, not just con a concentric circle. And it indicates the probable location of an electron, right? Probable, meaning you cannot say the electron is here or there. It is simply a probable, an area of probable location. An electron is probably in here somewhere. Now let's move on to uh, atomic orbitals and quantum numbers. So quantum numbers specify the properties of atomic orbitals and the properties of the electrons in those orbitals. So there are four of them. So here we go. The principal quantum number symbolized by n indicates the main energy level occupied by the electron. There is the angular momentum quantum number, symbolized by L, which indicates the shape of that orbital. We have the magnetic quantum number, symbolized by M, which indicates the orientation of an orbital around the nucleus. And then lastly, fourthly, the spin quantum number, which has only has two possible values, plus half or minus half, uh, also known as upspin or downspin. And the spin quantum number indicates the two fundamental spin states of an electron within an orbital. And this is actually the basis for the idea of quantum entanglement, if you've heard of that, or quantum computing. The principal quantum number n 
is a positive integer describing the energy level of the electron. For example, an electron for which n equals 1 occupies the first or lowest main energy level and is located closest to the nucleus. The angular momentum quantum number L can be any integer from 0 to n minus 1 and describes the shape of the orbital. The s orbital can be represented by a sphere. The p orbital can be represented by a dumbbell shape. The d orbital is primarily shaped like cross dumbbells, but can also have a fifth dumbbell ring shape. The magnetic quantum number m can be any integer from negative 1 to positive 1 and describes the orientation of the orbital. Orbitals run along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, as shown in this p orbital. The spin quantum number has only two possible values, positive one-half and negative one-half, which indicate the two fundamental spin states of an electron in an orbital. A single orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, which must have opposite spins. And so we see these different uh, quantum numbers in different ways. And so remember what each of them is saying. The principal quantum number is telling you what energy level that orbital is found in. L, the angular, uh, the angular momentum quantum number, is telling you the shape that it's going to take. And so we are going to look at um, several different shapes here. Right. So we have s orbitals are spherical in shape. We have p orbitals creating these this kind of uh, this dumbbell look, right? This is a uh, single dumbbell. And then we have the d orbitals, which have several different shapes, like uh, double dumbbells, but oriented differently in three dimensions with this weird fifth one, which is kind of like a donut around a single dumbbell. So these are the different shapes that you can find. Okay, these are the different values for L, the angular quantum, the angular momentum quantum number. So as you move forward, remembering, okay, principal quantum number represents the main energy level. What energy level is it? That's the same as asking how far away from the nucleus is it, right? n is equal to 3 is further from the nucleus and higher in energy than n is equal to 1, the ground state. Then you move on to L, the angular momentum quantum number. It's the shape of that particular orbital. We have spherical, we have dumbbell, we have double dumbbell, and then we have the f orbitals, which are really, really wacky shaped. Then we move on to M, the magnetic quantum number, which simply states the orientation that it takes in three-dimensional space. And so going back to these pictures, you see this spherical uh, orbital, orbital. You can't rearrange this in three-dimensional space. Right, it's a it's a sphere, and so there's only one orientation in three-dimensional space for this value. Right, when you're looking at an s orbital, for this single dumbbell look, there are three different ways that you can orient this. Right, you can orient it along the x-axis, along the y-axis, or along the z-axis. With these five different shapes that we see present in the d orbital, when l is equal to three or should I say to two, I apologize, um, there are five different orientations they can take, right, to house all the different shapes. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip two videos which I had planned on showing you that uh, uh, show you where those orbitals are on the periodic table, but those videos have broken, so I'm just going to have to show you in class. So again, here are the shapes of those d orbitals. Now, there are five different shapes, and so to make sure that they're not overlapping with one another, I have to orient those five shapes in three-dimensional space. So I'm going to have five different orientations. Now we're moving on to try to fulfill our last objective, which is relating the number of main energy levels, sublevels, and the number of orbitals. So this and the next slide, move on to that one, uh, is just a continuation of the exact same chart, which shows the relationship between the principal uh, energy level, right? So this is the uh, principal quantum number, n, 
we have the sublevels available. So this is going to represent L. We have the number of orbitals, so this is going to um, represent M, right? M. And so you're going to see on this chart is just a bunch of patterns. And if you can recognize the pattern and get used to the pattern and let the pattern predict the value, the next value that, you're, that you'll see, or on the question that I ask on the quiz or the test, you'll be able to get every question that I ask you. It's simply a pattern. For example, when n is equal to 1, l has to be 0. Because remember, the values for l are 0 all the way up to n minus 1. Well, when n is 1, n minus 1 is 0. So when l is 0, we only have s orbitals. right? And there's only one s orbital, so the number of orbitals is 1. Now, the number of electrons possible in a sublevel? Well, in every orbital, I can have two electrons. Two electrons. That's what Robot Lady told us when we were looking at the spin quantum number. And so if there's one orbital, I can have two electrons in that orbital. So the total number of electrons in n is equal to 1 is 2. I can have two total electrons. But when we go to n is equal to 2, again, L can be anything from 0 to n minus 1. Well, if n is 2, n minus 1 is 1. So when L is equal to 0, that's our s orbital, right? There's only one s orbital because you can't rearrange a sphere in three-dimensional space. But when L is equal to 1, we get p orbitals, right? The dumbbell shape, the single dumbbell shape. Now remember, you can rearrange that single dumbbell shape in three different ways, right? In three dimensions, three different ways. So when we have n is equal to 2, we have 1 s orbital and 3 p orbitals. 1 s orbital, 3 p orbitals. Now again, you can have two electrons per orbital. So you can get two electrons in the s, total of six electrons in all of the p orbitals. So the total number of electrons present, or possible I should say, doesn't mean they are present, but possible in n is equal to 2 is 8. I'll do one more and I'll let you uh, practice the uh, pattern on your own. When n is equal to 3, l, again, can be anything from 0 to n minus 1. If n is equal to 3, n minus 1 is 2. Right? So if um, l is 0, here's our s orbital, 1 s orbital. When l is 1, we get our three different p orbitals. But when l is equal to 2, we get 5 d orbitals, the five different shapes that we showed you throughout uh, the video lecture. And so now that we have two electrons possible in this one s orbital, six total electrons in the three p orbitals, and then a total of 10 electrons possible in the five d orbitals, add those all together, we have a total possible 18 electrons in the third principal quantum number, the third energy level, I should say, when n is equal to three. Now, it continues to go up to these very, very extraordinary numbers and these really, really weird shapes. Uh, we, we are very rarely going to ask questions about the f orbitals. Uh, we're certainly not going to ask questions about g or h because they are pretty much theoretical. Uh, I may ask you one question about an f orbital on a worksheet, but certainly not on an assessment. We're going to focus on s, p, and d. But... The pattern present on this chart will continue to hold up for all of these things, right? For all of these things, they'll, they'll follow the same pattern. So practice your pattern. Now, here's another represent, representation of the pattern, another way you can check. Uh, and this is for all the, the first 30 atomic orbitals. So when n is equal to 1, the only possible value for l is 0. When l is 0, m also has to be 0. So there's only one orbital. That's the 1s orbital, one orbital. When n is equal to 2, right, we go up an energy level. Again, L can equal zero. Okay, it can be anything from zero to n minus one. So meaning it can be zero, but it can also be one. If L is equal to zero, M is still zero, that's our two S. Right? It's not a one S anymore because we went up one uh, main energy level. When N is equal to two, L can be zero or one, but now that L is equal to 1, M has three possible values. It's going to be negative 1, 0, or 1. Well, that's three different orbitals. 
right? These are the 2p orbitals. There are three 2p orbitals. See, negative 1, 0, and 1. So there are three orbitals. Let's go up to one more energy level. n is equal to 3. So again, the L value can be anything from 0 all the way up to n is uh, uh, n minus 1, which in this case would be 2, right? So L can be 0, making m 0. Well, that's just an s orbital. This is our 3s orbital. There's only one of them. When L is equal to 1, we have our negative 1, 0, and 3. Or sorry, <laughs> negative 1, 0, and 1. Those are the three values there. So there are three orbitals. There are three 3p three orbitals. But when L is equal to 2, the possible values for m are negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We have five different numbers here. Well, that means that there are five orbitals in the d sublevel. There are five 3d orbitals, right? Now, on your own, practice this pattern with n is equal to 4 and see if you can make sense of the pattern. All right, guys, that's going to do it for uh, this video lecture, part 2 of the video lecture. We have one more uh, part to the chapter, chapter 4 video lecture, and it's time to move on to chapter 5. All right, chemistry, I will see you next period.